Well, here we are again, folks. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. I started um, about a week or so ago in Colossians, and I did a couple of excerpts already there. But just for the record, I want to back up to Colossians chapter 1 and reiterate the words of Paul the Apostle. This is Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Wow. If we look at the strength of this letter that Paul is in chains, Timothy is with him. And Paul's going to plant the message of grace to the Colossian people that lived in Colossae. And the church had been started there. And so Paul is writing this letter to a little small group in a church. You and I have kind of today a distorted thinking about the church. We think about a building set up somewhere and a bunch of people coming to it and calling that the church, the ecclesia. But the ecclesia of that day, the church of that day, was a little small band of folks, maybe two or three even, in a house somewhere. And it was the church come together. That was a church was a group of people, not a building. We have strayed away from the true meaning of church. We can go in a parking lot somewhere and gather up two or three and have a church meeting. That is Christians joining together, making the church. I did this little thing a, a week or so ago about here's, here's, here's the church and here's the steeple. Open the door and here's the people. Now, that's not exactly according to Hoyle. We can be in a parking lot with the people and that makes the church without a steeple. And so, the steeple was just a thing to mark the church. It is uh, through the apostle that the Holy Spirit leads the church. And does according to the message given. Now this apostle Paul is leading the church. And he's giving a message of grace. Only the Lord can present uh, a person that's put in a high office like a preacher, a deacon. God can present that one to people and have people accept that one. By doing that, he does that. Man cannot do it. Man cannot come up and just present a man and say, this is, this is it. If, if the people are going to hear him, they're going to hear him through the Spirit of God. The Spirit that comes from that man has got to be Spirit of God. If it's not, it's a flesh. And if it's a flesh, it's uh, entertainment. It's not just entertainment. It's educational thinking. But spiritual thinking and educational thinking are similar, yet they're different. They're like two things that look the same, but if you dig into them, they are not exactly the same. When he spoke to the, to the saints, verse 2, he meant the personage of that group. The, the individual people of that group 
those were called the saints. Not all Colossi were saints. Not all Colossians were saints. But those that were saints, he's talking to. And those that have an office was in the sainthood of a place to say, uh, look, y'all, this is the leader. I am the leader, and let's, let's us meet over here underneath this oak tree this afternoon. By the way, that was more or less a fact in that day. If you were caught worshiping Jesus in that day by certain groups, you'd get killed. And he said to the saints, that means he's talking to the Christian folks in verse 2. Those are the persons who have accepted Jesus Christ and become one with Jesus. And then when they meet somebody else that's become one with Jesus, they become one. So there's two people become one. And then you get six people together. Well, you've got six people that become one. United in the fact that Jesus Christ is in the center and that he's in each one of them and when they come together, it's a well-fit glove. And it fits well. And it's right. Now, he directed this particular book to those that were at Colossae. And this, and this book was written, you know, when Paul was in Rome, and, like I say, in bonds. And made possible by him speaking to Timothy, and Timothy... Uh, getting this down. And all of it was made possible by the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can unite a whole group of people is by the cross of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you, he says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, now Paul's saying that I have you in my mind continually. And I'm always thanking God that he gave us you few that are there in Colossae that want to follow him. So the prayer of Paul on a continual basis, a proper understanding of the cross, gives one a proper prayer life. If you understand the cross, I listened to a old record yesterday. I say old, 53, but the guy was preaching it in way much earlier than that, but it was in 53 when he put it on record. Uh, I forgot what it is now, but it was an old, old thing. What the man said, he'd say a sentence, and then he'd say, that's why I love Jesus. He died on a cross for me. And then he'd say, Jesus gave his life for me. That's why I love Jesus. Jesus said he'll hear my prayer. That's why I love Jesus. Jesus said, if you'll follow me, I will give you these things. That's why I love Jesus. I have peace in my heart and in my mind in my life because of the cross. That's why I love Jesus. And he went through that whole record, which was, I don't know, 30 minutes or so on the sermon. And that's what he said. That's why I love Jesus. And you know, I don't care how many years ago that was since the cross. We all have to say, that's why we love Jesus. I can draw that breath. Into a body that Jesus and God designed. And I can draw a breath into it. Because he designed a tree to make air. Air he doesn't need. 
that he made for mankind and for animals and for this earth that it could live with this air. That's why I love Jesus. He did it for us. He didn't make this earth just to cast it away. The reason it's tainted like it is is because of the devil coming on board and doing what he did. And because the devil came on board and did what he did, now we have a problem. Jesus has to tend this earth uh, like you would a garden on a continual basis. When he first made it, he wouldn't have had to. It was made to where it would take care of itself. But after thorns and thistles came on the earth after the sin, then Jesus has to now take care of it constantly. And he has to have Christians to take care of it and keep the thorns and thistles out. Now, if we were humanly speaking uh, about the sight of those thorns and thistles, we would be outdoors getting stuck by barbs and hung up by thistles and come in the house and have to sweep off a whole bunch of little barbs. And that's the actuality of it. But the factuality of it is the thorns and thistles are what the devil has and he's brought into the life of a person. And those you don't see hanging on a bush sticking you. Those are things the devil sticks you with from in the heart and the mind and internally. And these are not seen externally except in the fact that a lie came along has a thorn, a lie. <laughs> Paul said he has some thorns in the flesh. That's what he was talking about. The thorns in the flesh. Actually, Paul was talking too about he couldn't see good. And I'm sure as he got older, he couldn't hear good. <laughs> thorns and thistles coming along. Oh, my knee aches. Oh, me. Thorns and thistles in this life. If you will look at it that way. Now Jesus said these things were going to be. You know, Paul didn't found the church at Colossae. He wasn't the one that put it there. In fact, there was a probability that uh, Epaphus was the one who started that church. Uh, and the love which you have for, uh, toward all of these saints. He was talking about this church having an agape love, a real love. Actually, this church at Colossae helped other churches. <laughs> Almost a misnomer. Almost a thing of the past. Almost a thing you don't see anymore. Look, every church is not going to have all the people in their town. There isn't any church going to have all the people in their town. Listen to Brother Peter. If you're a Christian, and you can, you go to a church. Let's say you go to a church that's comfortable. And there's a little guy down the street. He's starting to build a church. He's took a building that used to be a church, and it was defunct, gone. He's opened the building. That's what my daddy used to do. He opened the building back up. And he stepped up in the pulpit. And he went out in the town. And he started getting up some people. It would do for you in this church that you're in. Stay in your church. You see the work going on down there? Go down and meet the man. Shake his hand. Tell him that you appreciate, and God appreciates you know what he's doing. And if I could help you in any way, I'll help you. you do you need some songbooks? We got some songbooks in our storage room. Yeah, I don't have any songbooks. Carry him those songbooks. Say, 
Do you need some Sunday school literature? We got a room up there stacked up with last months and last years and five years ago. And bring him some box of those. Uh, are we not all on the same team? How many years does a, a high school basketball player have to play before he gets on a big team? And he's never, not ever, going to get on a big team unless somebody else pulls him along and says to that other coach, Hey, I believe this guy's going to make it. I believe this guy's going to be something. So you got a little church started in your town. Go out and look. Are you in a big church? Go out and look. I'm helping a little old church right now in our little town. And, and we need to help those. We need to help those. You say, well, well, we need members over here. I don't care if you need members or not. You're not going to get the members. That man's going to get. I already some of those members that he's going to get think that you've gone up too many steps for them to come in. That you're too high up. And here's a guy down on the first step. And they say, well, I can walk right in level with him. And they walk in there. And they start out. Well, perhaps the preacher himself just got out of jail. Or perhaps that preacher himself just got off from dope. Perhaps the preacher himself just got off from a bunch of things. How are you going to help him? You're going to help him by doing something for him. He, he uh, himself uh, may not have a food closet for somebody else. You know why? He doesn't have hardly enough food in his own house. Have you? Are you in a big church? Are you in a church that's got a food closet? If you are, let me tell you this. A good advice. Go find that little church with that little man in it that just opened the doors, that is now just getting started. Look at his rooting and his grounding and try to help him. Say, by the way, I'm, I brought you a box of food for your own home. Hey, majority, majority, listen to Brother Peter, majority of men that start churches have nothing. Have nothing. People that have something don't usually go on and start something for somebody else. It's people that don't have something that go out and start something for somebody else. Because they have a need. They can see there's a man out there just like him that has a need too. And so they try to help. So listen to what Paul says here in verse 5. He says, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, Wherefore you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you. It is in, in all the world, and brings forth fruit, as it does also in you, since the day you heard. What is Paul saying here? If you dig into it, if you look at it, you can read it several, several, several. You can notch it up. And read it several different ways and just keep notching it up. I've notched it up to look what he's saying here. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Uh, wherefore you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. Somebody told them. Somebody told them physically before they heard in their heart. And that somebody was, was uh, probably uh, Epaphras, this little fellow. Did he have anything? He's walking across the country with his little uh, uh, sack hanging on his side that he could keep some, some dry jerky in. Does he have a drinking utensil? Possibly. But he, he's walking across the country. What does he do at night? 
You say, why in the world do they wear robes over there in that country? It's hot. I got news for you. When the sun goes down over in that country, it's cold. And by the way, I dressed in one of those guys when I was in Israel, and we went to the desert in Egypt. And I put all that garb on. I bought me the whole nine yards and the turban and everything. And I put that on and I rode on a camel on the desert. It's a hundred and something degrees out there. And riding on that camel with that garb on, I felt cool. But when nighttime came, I could pull that thing up over my head and curl up in it and tuck it under my feet and find me a hole somewhere and lay down in it and spend the night through the cool night with body heat. If I had gone over there dressed like I am right now and been stuck out there at night, I'd have froze to death. Or I'd, have, I'd have been sick the next day. Or if I had gone over there in the clothes I have and gone out on the desert, which a lot of people did, they like to burn up. These folks have got it down pat how to survive in that country, in that land. Their dress for that land is a necessity. It's a necessity. You and I, in, in America, uh, we, we don't know what it, what it is to be out in the elements like those folks are on a 24-7 basis. <laughs> you, you, haven't got, you might carry a tent with you on a camel. A small camel hair tent or a small tent made with uh, uh, lambskins or something. But if you don't have one, you better have your robe on to protect yourself. Listen, uh, Paul is talking here to these folks. Truth. He says truth. And ye know the grace of God in truth. How do you know truth? You actually experience truth. The truth of the matter is, is that when God comes on the scene, you experience a difference in your life. And that's the grace of God. You cannot function in truth unless the grace of God comes on you and you accept Jesus Christ and Him crucified, then you have truth. Verse 7, he said, As you also learned, of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, as stated, he was a disciple of Paul, who is for the faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto you your love in the Spirit. So he's saying that this guy that was my disciple heard me and accepted what I said. He's brought it to you, and you accept what he says as if I said it. And, and he was a lesser than Paul, but he wasn't in prison. <laughs> but he was preaching the word. And so we've got to remember that it's important for us to go on and preach the word. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. How do you get filled with the knowledge of the will of God? By studying behind people and in the Bible the will of God. If you'll study the will of God by reading the Bible and study what His desire is for you is to learn what was written in the Bible. Who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Now, Epaphras uh, somehow connected with Paul, whether he did it by sending a messenger or a letter or whatever, saying, hey, I started a church in uh, Colossae, and, and those little Colossians there, they got this house going, 
and they got five or six people in this house and they really 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 are studying and they have found out the true meaning of Jesus dying on the cross and boy they are going gung-ho Wow Paul said beautiful what a picture one man passing on what the other man said and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge that's how you do it by getting together and having spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord and pleasing walking means a type of behavior he's talking here about a type of behavior that you would behave this is what your manner of conversation is your behavior I said that before I'll say it again how you behave is what your conversation is people read more what you do than what you say I can say I'm a Christian and never go to church do you think anybody's going to believe me? Not on your life. I can say I'm a Christian and every time the door's open, I'm going to church. Do you think people are going to believe me? Yes, they are. Why? Because of the manner of irism of my life, my conversation of my life. I'm out here going to church. Actually, there are some people in our town, used to be, real bad. Knew I was going to church on Wednesday night and Sunday, so they'd come pilfer my house, pilfer my place. <laughs> they said, well, we know he's going to be gone. So we can go over there and walk around and do what we want for an hour or two. And they did. Look, being fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all presence. And long suffering and patience with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into his kingdom, the kingdom of his dear Son. Wow. Man. When Paul uses the word meat, meat is stronger than bread. And meat was a, a, a thing he used that, that sentence, the meat for, was he used that sentence to say, hey, you guys are the beefsteak. You guys are the beefsteak of the gospel. This is what we wanted. We've sowed beans and peas and corn and all those lightweight vegetables. And now, here comes a church in Colossae. Wow. And it's me. It's, it's there. It's really something. It's the top of the line of food. It's what you need for nourishment. And this is what Paul did need for nourishment. He's hanging in chains. <laughs> to hear this, to him, was a boost. Look. In whom we have redemption through his blood, Jesus Christ even the forgiveness of sins, who is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Listen to this. Will you listen to this? Jesus Christ was the firstborn physical body of every living creature. When in heaven, Jesus and God spoke and talked, they said, let us go down and make man in our own image. Jesus had a fleshly image with the Father. And he said, I was with the Father in the beginning. Read Proverbs chapter 8. And read it. I know it says wisdom, but Jesus is wisdom. And it says some things in there that only Jesus could say. It said, by me were all things formed and made by it spoken he's the one who spoke it by me he said can you go to heaven by me wisdom can you die and go to heaven and live eternally only Jesus can say that only Jesus can say that well look our time has come and gone it's been very good to be with you today 
I hope and pray that you will uh, look at some more of these PH tidbits. I would appreciate it if, uh, for God's sake, for the sake of the Lord and the spreading of the gospel, you would tell others about PH tidbits. And you yourself, if you're a Christian, do some tidbits yourself. Just put your two initials in front of them and put them on. They'll come on, even on this same station. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.